This is my practice in Malvern, Smiles on Broadway. Um, it's a very nice office to work in. We have a very nice culture, and we'll describe that later. Um, my partner, Dr. Lizio, that's my third wife. And I have a wonderful team who I just adore every single one of them. I, it's a pleasure to be able to spend every day with them. I look forward to being there every morning and, and arriving early so that we can have a good, fruitful, and productive, productive day. But things were not always so rosy in my practice. Um, you see, about 12 years ago, I was in an accident that uh, caused me to be out for about nine months. Um, a few days before I was in that accident, I had a partner who, in the middle of the night, because he was behind on his um, income taxes, was taken out of my office by the government. And um, in trying to recapture things, when I showed up my office the next morning, my equipment was gone, my computers were gone, and my charts were gone. And then a couple of days later, I was in the accident, so it was very difficult to try to keep a very productive and successful practice going, uh, but you don't have all the resources at your disposal, and you're not able to work. And so a practice that had been over, well over a million dollars was starting to deteriorate and that deterioration would virtually eliminate that practice completely and take it away. Um, one of the problems that complicated it was nine months into uh, the, the healing process for my accident, I retore the shoulder and I had a shoulder transplant, which put me out for another 15 months. So altogether, I was out of work for two years. Uh, during the, the latter part, I did hire uh, Dr. Lizio as an associate, and she helped keep the practice together somewhat. It still was just a shell of what it had once been. Uh, at around the time that we was, I was starting to feel that I could come back to work, uh, we were all hit with 9-11, and that was devastating for many practices in, in the metropolitan area. Um, it hit my practice um, significantly because we had uh, two team members who lost family members. And uh, so it was devastating. And it took a while for all practices to recover from, from that um, tragedy. And just about the time we were starting to feel that things were getting better, one of my team members was crossing the street in Manhattan and was hit by an out of control uh, drunk taxi cab driver. And when it pinned her up against the building, she lost her left leg completely up to the hip and lost the use of two arms. Um, and so even though our practice was not able to carry on the way we would have liked, we felt that it was more important to help others the culture we created in our office. So we spent the next six months praying that our team member would recover. Uh, she did come out of her, um, out of her coma. Um, and over a period of six months, we were able to buy her a computerized press set limb, a hand-operated vehicle, and we handed her a half million dollars in cash. So we were very proud of that. And then my partner came to me and said, well, Steve, he said you want us to work together, but we don't have much of a practice here, so what are we going to do? And I had long been a, a student of practice management. I had gone to every speaker on the circuit. I had been to every guru. I had spoken to them on the phone. I had listened to all their CDs and tapes. And it was time to start putting into practice everything that I had learned in listening to the experts. So we accumulated, we put together a terrific team. We spent a lot of time in training. We developed systems. We, we did a lot of role playing. We took it seriously. We developed verbal skills that were necessary to raise the perceived value. We learned how to communicate well together. We did things that were supportive of one another. And over a period of eight years, we were able to take our practice from a $300,000 practice to a two and a half million dollar practice. And that's where it is today. So when you look at this slide and it says, your family doesn't get it while you talk about tea. Your friends think you're speaking a foreign language. Your dog even looks at you funny but we understand. And when I hear dentists saying that they're struggling today, I can relate to that because I've been to hell and back in my course, and I know what it is to be, to be involved in a recovery. And all practices today with what's going on with the economy and what's going on in the world around us are in a recovery mode. We're going to try to teach you today some of the skills that are necessary to make your recovery a booming success in your practice. 
we've already talked about the hardship. This is the uh, the trend that, that Monroe has gone through. You'll see a couple of little dips here, and that's because as we've gotten busier in doing the coaching, I am now down to working three days a week uh, from a five-day week schedule. So I've been able to maintain the same production in practice even though I've cut out 47 of the time. So when we go around and we speak to dentists, we speak to team members, the common thread we always hear is, well, if we just had more feet to serve patients, that would solve everything. How many of you feel that? Okay, good. But it's really not the case. There, there are more things involved in growing practices than just getting the new patients. Because if you're not prepared to handle those patients in the proper way, and you're not able to capitalize on whatever marketing you've done, it's wasted and, and your practice is, is like a funnel keeping the flow of patients from becoming what they could become for your practices. So there are four ways to grow a practice. You guess you can increase your number of new patients, but more importantly, I think, are two through four. Increase your capacity to do more dentistry, increase the number of high profit procedures you do, and increase your case acceptance rate. And that is critical with how your communication skills are, and that's why we're going to devote tonight to talking about communication skills. What we're facing in dentistry today is something that I'll call commoditization. And it's the pressures from insurance companies, it's the pressures from large companies who are trying to make it that what we do is indistinguishable from one office to the next. That a crown is a crown, a restoration is a restoration, a denture is a denture. And as long as they can make that indistinguishing uh, theory, then it takes away a lot of patient perception that quality is something that you can strive for in one office greater than another. And so we feel that we need to do things in our own practices that make us distinguishable from one another, to make us better is special, that we provide better service, that we show that we care more, that we show that we are connected with the patients more. And that comes through communication. Why is it that some practices struggle and some succeed? You know, a lot of people will blame it on the capitalization, on the people, leadership, bad market condition. But the fact is, we use the same material, we do basically the same procedures, we have the same supplies, we use the same types of labs. What is it that makes one office succeed and, and others not? It's the fact that they've decided to do so. And if you develop a belief that you want to be successful and you're going to do the things that are necessary to become successful, that's what's going to drive you to success ultimately. 